Hello, everyone, and welcome to another Spotlight from Stetson University. Uh, I am Chris from the Brown Center. Uh, so we're having uh, Dr. Corey Charpentier, uh, Assistant Professor of uh, Biology, speaking today on the topic of the impact of light pollution on coastal zooplankton. Thank you, Dr. Charpentier, and you may begin. Hey, so thank you, Chris, for that introduction. Um, and thank you for those of you that have come to hear me chat a little bit about some of my recent research on light pollution and coastal zooplankton. Uh, a lot of the analysis that you'll see today has been conducted since I started my time here at Stetson. However, initial experiments and sort of my thought process began at Rutgers University during a postdoc, so I thought I should highlight that too. So why not start with the biggest picture possible? Right, so this is a global map. And the coloration that you see on this map represents light radiating from Earth's surface. Right, so the warmer colors that you see, the yellows and the reds, that's going to indicate more light radiating versus the blues and the grays, which will be less light. All right, and you may notice just at a quick glance, the places that you see a lot of light radiating outwards are also where there are a lot of people and human development. Right, so really what we're getting an image of here is artificial light at night, right? This is light coming from our own developments that we use all of the time. I'll also note that this nighttime light environment has changed dramatically over the last century or two. All right, so you think about all of the biology that we coexist with on the planet and how that could alter their nighttime light environment when it's a lot brighter in developed regions. Right, including where we are right now. And you'll see we're a pretty bright point on the map. And so because there is this implication that changes in light can affect biology, we often refer to artificial light at night or Allen also as light pollution. So I'll use those two things sort of interchangeably today. Right, and so where is all of that Allen coming from? Well, we all use it all of the time if we want to do anything after the sun sets, right? So for navigation and safety. I've got some street lights up here, and then I also have sort of a big shipping yard marina on the right side. This is gonna be about coastal animals, so trying to stay coastal as much as I can. I will point out that the two street lights that you see in this, right, on the left and in the middle, the one on the left is a high pressure sodium lamp. These are kind of the yellow street lights that you usually see, so they, they line a lot of freeways in this country and globally. Um, I will say that many regions are switching over to LED streetlights, which is that brighter white light that you see in the center. LEDs are great because they're energy efficient. Uh, they allow us to see a little bit better, but is it possible that their brightness could affect biology a bit more? Something we'll explore today. And then of course we use Allen artificial light all the time to be productive, to be comfortable in our own homes, and even for fun, and the most extreme example I could come up with was Times Square and all of this ridiculous artificial light that's used every day. All right, so what are some biological responses to artificial light? Uh, this is a classic image, right? We've all seen a moth fly directly into a light bulb at some point in our life, right? A lot of nocturnal insects will be disoriented by a bright light source. But not only that, there's been a lot of research on nocturnal insects. Also shows that their night day cues are a little messed up by brighter regions, and that could lead to altered reproduction and even biodiversity in some developed areas. Birds migrate vast distances. And some of those areas now have a lot more artificial light than they used to, two centuries ago. And so there's some evidence that bird migration is affected by changes in the nighttime light environment. This one's a little sad. Um, sea turtles, right? So this is a sea turtle hatchling here. They'll often use reflection off of the water's edge to navigate towards the sea after they hatch. But what happens when there's a bright light behind them in the middle of the road, illuminating the street? Sometimes they will be attracted to that, leading to sad endings that I don't want to dwell on, right? And then to bring it back home to humans, artificial light at night, yes, it's used for productivity, which is great, 
uh, but it can actually mess with our sleep cycles a bit, which is why you always hear these recommendations to not stare at a screen too late or to put a blue filter over your screens, right? So there's been quite a large body of work on biological responses to artificial light. However, within that large body, there's relatively few studies that investigate potential effects to either marine or coastal animals. You might remember from that initial map I showed you, a lot of coastlines are well developed, right? We tend to go to places that have a lot of resources like the coast, we've developed there, and now there's a lot of artificial light there. So recently, there's been sort of a call to figure out if anything's happening to coastal animals or other organisms there. And there's been quite a few studies that have come out in the last 10 years or so that show interesting and relevant responses to artificial light. I just pulled up one kind of fun, right? So responses during polar night when it's dark all of the time, focusing on fish and zooplankton. Zooplankton are gonna be the topic of this talk, so I figured I may as well highlight why zooplankton? What the heck are they? Here are a few examples of coastal zooplankton. The zooplankton are animal drifters. So that means that they don't swim very well against a horizontal current. Uh, they can swim up and down okay, which we'll talk about a little bit more later. But the idea is they're not strong like a fish, so they can't fight the current. They end up drifting and they're sort of suspended in the water column. So here are three examples. So I've got a little crustacean, a copepod on the left, a mollusk in the middle, that's a pteropod, and then a cone jelly on the right-hand side. So many plankton are quite small, particularly the two on the left there, or about the, the tip of your pen is a close estimate of how big they are. Um, all three of these examples exist suspended in the water column as plankton their entire life history. There are examples of plankton that are only there for a short period of time, right? And the fluxes of those plankton can be important too. So I just animated on a larval crab. You can see the adult on the bottom right. That is not to scale. The adult is much bigger than the larva, but I wanted a reference, right? So these animals are in the plankton for a few weeks, sometimes a few months before they mature into their adult form that hangs out on the bottom or rocky shorelines in this case. This is a larval barnacle, right? So I think most of us are familiar with barnacles, but maybe not what they look like when they are just emerging into their life cycle. So this is a planktonic larval bar barnacle. Oysters are also part of the zooplankton community, right? So there's lots of these oyster larvae in this region, actually, which is great. And then fish, right? So I've got one representative larval fish here. This happens to be a summer flounder on the right side. And so the question is, why use zooplankton to determine potential effects of artificial light in coastal ecosystems? Well, I hope that you can tell, even if you've never seen any of these animals before, that this is a really diverse group. All right, so zooplankton represent a lot of different uh, shapes, sizes, and species within, right? There's even multiple phyla shown just on this slide. And so if we can figure out what's happening within the zooplankton you can learn more about the overall picture in the ecosystem. They also serve as a, we call it a trophic link. Uh, essentially, they're fish food, right? And they eat microalgae, which a lot of other things can't eat, and pass that up into the food web. So it's important to know what this trophic link is up to, how it's responding. And then because they're eating all this algae, they do migrate up and down, which we'll talk more about. They are pushed around in coastal ecosystems. And with them, they carry things like carbon. So we want to know where they're going to determine more about nutrient cycles. And so the main question of my talk today is how does Allen, this artificial light at night, impact coastal zooplankton? Before I tell you exactly how I tested uh, this question, uh, I will give a little bit of background on zooplankton responses to light. Uh, that way I can better frame my experimental approach, which was twofold. All right, first, I conducted a bunch of behavioral experiments in the lab to see if I could pinpoint specific responses in different animals. And then this past summer, went out into the field to determine whether some of those behavioral changes that I've observed could be picked up 
by sampling zooplankton from different depths. All right. And as you will figure out while I'm talking through this entire project, these data are new and they're still being analyzed. And so I'm kind of in the midst of this work. So I feel like it's appropriate to close with ideas for future work in the short term and long term. So if we're going to talk about zooplankton behavior, we should discuss what it's like to be one. Right? So imagine yourself suspended in this water column. Really doesn't look like there's a ton of information here. Right? Kind of a bland place to live. So what are these animal drifters doing to actually go towards or away from cues? How are they spending their time? All right, so one major piece of information here is light. Right? It's brighter near the surface and it's darker near the bottom. So they can figure out depth using light if they're capable. Pressure also increases as you go down. So that's another way to figure out what depth you're at and adjust accordingly if you need to. But on top of those physical cues, right, you probably want to swim away from predator odor. Probably want to swim towards food. That's always a good thing. I think we can relate to that. And there are other chemical and physical properties of the water that may be favorable or not. And so reacting to that behaviorally or physiologically is all part of their daily life as well. I will focus on light during this talk, but I just don't want to forget to point out that their behaviors are an interaction of multiple things. And so that will be part of the complexity that comes from the field data, as always. So what are some responses to light? So things we already knew about before I even started working on this. I'm gonna use crab larvae as a case study here because we know a lot about them. Right, so we know, and we've known for several decades that these animals swim towards point sources of light. So things like a flashlight. All right, this is an actual video that I took. You can see sort of the larger dot there migrating towards a light bulb that's on the right hand side. When you think about the application of this response, it's not really a natural light source, right? There's not a lot of point light sources in nature. There's a handful, but not many. Uh, but these days, a lot of coastal animals might be dealing with dock lights and boat lights. And so they may be attracted to them, even though otherwise it's sort of an artificial behavior that they don't normally do. That's one thing to know. But it's also not how they behave to all lights, right? So they actually swim away from what we call diffuse downwelling light, kind of the normal changes in light that penetrate through the water column, right? And so if they detect a change in light above them, they tend to swim down. Of course, diffuse downwelling light can come from the sun, it can come from the moon, and these days it can actually come from sky glow, right? You can see in the image on the bottom right there, above a nice little city or townscape, we have almost a looming glow, right? And so that's the summation of scattering from all of the artificial light sources below. Uh, you can see it coming up in the distance when you're about to hit a rather developed region. And so increase in sky glow could act more like, oh, I don't know, a full moon when it's not a full moon. So it is something to consider. I'm going to show a really short video clip of this descent response where they're swimming away from downwelling light. All right. So right here, what you can see, all these little dots, those are larval crabs. This happens to be the species in the left corner here. When I hit play, you'll watch them sort of calmly swim. But when you see a light animated on top, that means I've turned on the overhead or downwelling light source. All right, so nice and gentle swimming. And then when we turn on the light source, you can see a pretty dramatic descent response for such a small animal. They're actually pretty speedy and strong, right? And so you can tell this is the opposite response of before. They're not going towards the light, they're going away from it. And so this adds a layer of complexity when we think about coastlines that have both point and diffuse light sources. Right. I've talked about crab larvae. They are not the only contributor. Right? There's a lot of animals that exist in the zooplankton community. Some of them have strong directional responses. We just saw that with the larval crabs. Uh, copepods, which is the animal featured just to the right of the crab there, they have pretty strong directional responses too. There are similarly crustaceans or decent swimmers. Uh, this is a barnacle larva. 
right? And they, they do respond directionally to light, but it's a, a little less pronounced, um, appears slower and less dramatic. And then you have things like oyster larvae. I would say they have a relatively weak response. There is some evidence, I just, I put up one paper there, Wheeler et al. They found that in response to light, these animals tend to increase their spinning behaviors and there's some indication that they might die, but it's just not as strong and directional as some of the other species that uh, exist in the plankton community. So why might there be variation here? Some pretty simple answers. Uh, some of them are stronger swimmers, right? They've got nice appendages, they can navigate through the water really well, much better than if you just have you know, a little bit of musculature to help you move and you're only in the water column for a bit. But crab larvae and copepods, they're strong swimmers. In order to respond to light, in addition to swimming, you have to be able to see it, right? And so what I tried to blow up there, but the resolution changed on this for some reason, larval crab and a lot of other crustaceans have sensitive high functioning visual systems, right? So they have these compound eyes, uh, they see very well, they're sensitive to changes in light, and there's a lot of work that supports that. And so having a good visual system helps you swim away from light or towards light. It's also important to note that the spectrum of the light matters, right? This figure is from a publication by Cohen et al. in 2015, and they essentially measured physiological responses in the retina of a larval crab. And so they measured that, that's on the y-axis, the relative response. On the x-axis, you can see different wavelengths. If you don't deal with light and wavelengths a lot, I put a cheat sheet of a rainbow under there, okay? And so the point here is their data, the dotted line that you see with the points, the peaks in the blue, right? This indicates that these animals, these larval crabs are sensitive to blue light. This is not a novel finding. There is a lot of species that have a very similar response. We know tons about marine crustaceans and several other marine animals that are most sensitive to blue light and really not much else. You can see in the reds there, it drops off completely. A good reason for this could be that, well, blue light penetrates through the water column farther than anything else. So you may as well use the most reliable light view in your visual system, All right? So I want you to remember that a lot of marine animals are quite sensitive to blue in particular. And hopefully, I set the stage to defend my approach, starting off with some behavioral responses in the lab. Asking the basic question, is zooplankton behavior affected by artificial light? Right. And I took three different species to test this question. A larval crab, a larval barnacle, and a larval oyster. I've already talked about these a little bit on purpose, uh, so that I could set the stage and say these all have different responses to light. Some of them are stronger than others. And so by testing across the spectrum, maybe I can learn about variation and response in the community. I did quite a few experiments here. Um, some of them looked at changes in diffuse downwelling light that were both natural and artificial. And some looked at point source light changes, right? So we're comparing basically responses to sky glow with an artificial light, or maybe a dock light or a boat light. For the diffuse downwelling light experiments, I subjected these animals to flashes that resembled moonlight, others that loosely resembled high pressure sodium street lights, that yellow street light that we saw before. And I'll explain what I mean by loosely. And then also a light source that resembled LED street lights. Right, so they got all of those treatments. And then I did a series of experiments with point source light given an LED flash or LED lights that have the blue wavelengths removed, the ones that we think that they're most sensitive to the previous work. All right. For the purposes of today, I'm going to share and focus on an experiment with a larval crab and focus on diffuse downwelling light. So those are the results that you're going to see. And before I could do any experimentation at all, I had to figure out, well, what kind of lights do I want to use? What makes sense? All right? And so I went out and found the spectra of some environmental cues that I thought would be relevant. All right? The first one being moonlight. So you can see light intensity on the y-axis across the, the wavelengths. So this is going to be a spectrum for each one. 
And again, I put my little rainbow cheat sheets there for you as well. The moonlight data came from Dr. Sanka Johnson uh, from at Duke, who has a very sensitive light meter and was nice enough to share it with me. As you can see, the full moon spectrum is pretty broad, right? You've got all kinds of wavelengths, a nice smooth curve there. That's going to be a little different from our street light sources. So the yellow high pressure sodium lamp street light doesn't have much of a blue contribution at all. It's got some peaks in the yellows, the oranges, and the greens. Right? That's why it appears yellow to us. The LED street light that appears white to us, I want to focus on the fact that it has a very large blue peak. This is typical of LEDs, particularly the ones that are marked cool LEDs, right? When you go to home depot or lows, they have a large blue peak, which is important if you consider the animal response to that or the potential one. So I took this information and tried to mimic these light sources in the lab in a behavioral chamber. All right. And so, like I said, some of them are loose representations, but let me talk through it. Um, so same idea, we've got the spectrum of each of these. When you look at, when you look vertically, right? So the full moon mimic is right under, and that's a xenon arc lamp. All right, so you can see I have a lamp that mimics that spectrum roughly because it's a nice broad spectrum. As far as our yellow street light, well, I didn't have one in the lab. So I may do by sticking a filter in front of the xenon arc lamp that at least cuts out the blue, right? And so we can see what it might look like to remove some of that blue light and have a yellower spectrum, although not a perfect mimic of the sodium lamp. And then on the right, I have an LED lamp that I could use as a street light mimic for that one, and that matches up pretty well. So these lights are placed outside of a dark enclosure, a dark chamber, and the light will bounce off of the mirror at 45 degrees, pass through a diffuser, and hit a water bath. At the very center of that water bath is a chamber that contains the animals. Right? And I will say this is not entirely to scale, and I want to give you some perspective here. The chamber within that water bath that contains animals is about uh, five by five centimeters, so it's pretty small. And I fit approximately 25 animals for this experiment each time. Okay. And the nice thing about having far red backlight in the lab is that the animals cannot see that. And so I was able to film them while they still remained entirely in darkness. Right. So the output looks much like the video that you saw towards the beginning of the presentation, where I've got this nice bright background and dark dots on that background so I can trace them. So I measured a few parameters here, but I'm going to focus on one of them, which is the percentage of animals descending, right? That's the, that's the data that I'm going to share with you. It is the most interesting data set that I have. Um, essentially, if you have an animal at the start of a video clip, you can say, all right, it's at this coordinate, and then figure out whether or not it actually swam down. The cutoff I used was plus or minus 60 degrees. So you can see that in the representation on the right-hand side here. All right, so I calculated the percentage of animals descending. And I gave them a bunch of overhead light flashes of different intensity to see what happened at all of my lamps. And so eventually, this is going to be a three panel figure situation, but I'm going to overlay them on one at a time so I can talk through them. And so what you're looking at is the percentage of animals descending, right, plus or minus 60 degrees, across different light intensities. And the first lamp results are for my xenon arc lamp, which you might remember, resembles the moonlight spectrum. All right, you can see there's two curves on here. It is behavioral data, so it does look a little messy. Uh, the black trend that you see are animals that are swimming in the dark, right? In order to figure out if they're responding to light, I have to know what they're doing in the dark as a baseline. And then animals that are exposed to these overhead light flashes are shown in red, right? So that's like the before and the after. So, what I had to do here was run some statistical analysis to figure out if these two curves are actually different from each other. So I did this each time, but we'll start with this one. So I ran a little model and the asterisks at the top, these will pop up every time, right? If I found a significant result. So in this case, it looks like, yep, the light is different than the dark, so they are responding. 
I then ran some post hoc tests, or a post hoc test, to figure out, okay, well, at which light level can we actually detect this? In this particular lamp, it looks like the brightest light level indicated by the asterisk here. Looks like the brightest light level elicited at the sent response. Great. All right. We're going to see the same thing for the other lamps, right? So here is my xenon arc lamp with the filter that looks like the yellow light. Same thing, we've got dark and light trends. I ran a statistical analysis. And again, I do find that there's a difference between the dark and the light. And so what I'm thinking is, oh, wow, well, yeah, you can definitely see, right? A little bump up in the percent descending. But when I ran my post hoc tests, no differences were determined. Again, behavioral data can be a little messy. And you should notice that the response does appear to be a little lower at around 40, 45 percent versus closer to 60. And then the last line, the LED lamp, right? Ran my statistical analysis again. I do find that there's a difference between light and dark. So all three have the same result here, great. Then when I ran my post hoc test, the three brightest light levels came out here, right? So there's a significant descent response at those three levels. Right? What this indicates is or suggests, I should say, is that the LED responses are a little bit more dramatic, particularly than the filtered light, and maybe even the moonlight one, right? And I'm going to just overlay. This is just visual. There's nothing mathematical about this gray line. But what the gray line shows, or what I tried to align here, is you know roughly the maximum response for the average of the maximum response that we're getting in the filtered light, right, in the sensor here. This helps me see, at least, when I drag that over to the LED lamp, that there's an increase of about 10 to 15 percent of the animals that are descending, which I find it hard to see without adding the line. I don't know if that's a me problem, but it does help you see, okay, well, maybe there is a difference, and it's supported, and that's happening with the LED light in particular. So an appropriate follow-up question here is, Yes, this is a behavioral response that was measured in the lab. But labs allow you to control a lot of things. So can you actually find this death signature in the field, right? In theory, when things swim down, they will be deeper. But is this just a small lab experiment that you can't reflect by field data? Right? It's important to at least try to find out. So this past summer, with the help of some wonderful students who I'll highlight in a second, I went out into the field. And right, you can see this is another one of those radiance maps. Um, these data are from NOAA to help orient you. The north end of the map is around Daytona Beach, and the south end, Titusville, is towards the south end right here. All right, so we went out to two field sites. One of them was in Canaveral National Seashore, where it is pretty dark, right? There's not a lot of light pollution in the national park. Uh, the image that you see on the right side there is outward looking from our field site. Uh, but when we actually measured and collected things, it was like that, right? Because all of these measurements were taken after astronomical pilot. The bright site we selected was in New Smyrna Beach, kind of right in the center of that nice orange <laughs> flame looking section of the radiance map. And you can tell that just by the picture on the right hand side, which again is an outward looking photo of our field site. You can see lots of artificial lights there. According to these data from NOAA, the bright site is about 100 times, actually more than 100 times brighter than the dark site. In order to sample plankton from specific depths, we couldn't just willy nilly dump a net in the water. We had to have a nice, uh, discrete setup. And so I used a submersible pump to do this that I could lower to different depths in the water column. Water was pumped up through some hosing and PVC pass through an inline flow meter into a plankton net. The flow meter is there so that I can regulate the volume of water that's being sampled, right? So everything should be normalized to that later. And the plankton net is essentially a cone of mesh that lets everything that's smaller than about 300 microns through and luckily keeps all of my animals, right? And the whole thing there can just be portable, uh, powered by a portable generator. So it's pretty easy. So samples were taken during four moon phases because obviously the moon is light and contributes to the behavior of these animals too. So we sampled during full moon, first quarter, new, and third quarter. 
and at two depths, right? So 0.5 meters from the surface and 0.5 meters from the bottom. All right. Overall, 80 samples were collected between the two sites for moon phases, two depths, and then each was replicated five times. We also took some water quality measurements while we were there. So these three students, Laura Jones, Tom Sesson, and Brandy of Sosa, all came out to help me over the summer. Right? And they not only just collected zooplankton, but they helped collect zooplankton in places like Mosquito Lagoon in the middle of the summer at night. It is exactly what it sounds like. Right? So these are troopers, and I'm really thankful that they were able to come and help out. So once the samples are collected, I drain out the plankton and I collect them from the cotta and basically this little cup at the bottom of my illustration. Each sample was split with a balsam splitter. Half of that sample was used for biomass analysis, so it was put on a filter and frozen for later. And the other half was preserved in formaldehyde, where we can look at the abundance of different animal groups within the sample. The biomass analysis is done. I have some data to show you. The abundance analysis is in progress, but I will talk about it. Right, so this is one of my senior research students, Renia Sosa. Right here, she is measuring wet weight and dry weight of each of the samples we collected. Right, so she took them out of the freezer, got some wet weights, dried them for at least 24 hours, and took dry weights of each. So typically, uh, when reporting biomass, we'll use dry weight per whatever volume of seawater was filtered. So I'm going to show you some data of milligrams of dry weight over uh, meters cubed of seawater filtered. Remember that we actually went out four separate times, right, for each of the four moon phases that I described. And so the graph you see here is showing biomass between those two sites, right? So there was a dark site and a bright site. And then the different colors of the graph represent the shallow sample, which was 0.5 meters below the surface, and the deep sample, which was 0.5 meters above. Right? At a first glance, you might notice, all right, well, there's more biomass at the dark site. At least it appears to be. And I don't know if there's much of a depth signature. We'll keep looking. During the first quarter moon, similar trend, although there was a big spike in biomass here. Be interested to see what actually happened here when we look at the, the abundance data. And I don't know if there's much of a depth signature here either. During the new moon, it looks a lot like the full moon between the two sites. And during the last quarter, we have a little bit of a bump up in biomass at the dark site. Uh, these data are really new, um, and so I'm going to be spending more time with them, kind of figuring out exactly what's happening here, but I still wanted to share them. I did do a quick analysis, just ran some two-way ANOVAs uh, to work through any effects, you know, that, that I could pull out of these data here just as a, as a first pass. Um, I did find that there was an effective site that appears obvious from these data, right? It looks, generally speaking, the dark site has a higher biomass. And I will not attribute that to light pollution because it is also a national park. Therefore, there's a lot of reasons why there might be more biomass in that area. I didn't find any depth signature yet. But I will say that I, I'm not, not discouraged because the whole thing with zooplankton is that it's a community. And it's a community that's going to respond differently. And so what we actually have to do is figure out what are the individual animal groups doing in here? And does that even matter if they're responding differently? Right. So in order to do that, we have to figure out who's in the sample. Right. So this is what uh, Sage Jasinski, another one of my senior research students, is working on. And so Sage is sorting through the first quarter main samples to figure out specific zooplankton groups within. Right. She's gotten very good at this. She can identify all the different groups. Although Sage is mostly interested in changes in copepod abundance in the samples, um, she's categorizing everything for me. So I'm very thankful. It's a lot of work. I did accidentally give Sage the sample with the most biomass, which I only found out last week. Um, so she has been a, an extra trooper when she's been telling me how many copepods she's gotten. I've been like, oh, great. But now I know it, it really is a lot. And so she's been doing a wonderful job. And we get to figure out sooner rather than later what's going on here in terms of the big spike in biomass at the dark site, which I'm interested to know. All right. And so that's the experimental approach. It is obviously in the middle. All right. So let's talk about where it's going. All right. 
I do need to finalize some of the behavioral analysis. I only shared part of it with you today. I also am really interested to find out what's happening uh, with the direct light experiments. I've, I've worked mostly with the diffuse light ones. Although Laura Jones, who helped me over the summer, has also helped with some of that analysis. So be excited to see uh, the results of her work later too. Related to these experiments, I also worked with a copepod, but I, I didn't share that earlier. Uh, my senior research student, Kaylee Vialco, is working on this analysis. The experimental design was a bit different from my other ones, so I kind of kept it out of the initial view, but I do want to point out that it is going to contribute to this artificial light project. And I've, I've looked at depth differences, or lack thereof, in biomass, but more focus on the abundance, which stage is starting and myself and others will finish, right? But related to that is actually figuring out what some of the local zooplankton community members are actually doing and what their behaviors are like, right? The previous animals that you see on the top left there, those are all collected in New Jersey. There are different species here, like this mangrove crab that Brianna Bash, my other senior research student, is working with. And so Brianna is trying to figure out what, how these larvae behave and how that could affect their dispersal. But all of that can be placed back into our understanding of the abundance of different groups and where they are in terms of depth. Longer term applications for this work could be considering things like LED filter recommendations. LEDs are great, right? They're energy efficient, uh, better for the environment. But if they're inducing a lot of biological responses, maybe a cheap filter or warmer colors could just be a simple solution for that, which is still safe for us in terms of navigation. And then on a much broader scale, right? This project focuses on the potential impacts of artificial light. There are other things happening in local ecosystems. And so zooplankton, because of their biodiversity, are an interesting indicator of ecosystem resilience if you're able to sample them long term. So that's another thing to consider based on the results of this experiment and then maybe applying some of those methods moving forward. All right, so before I close, I want to make sure that I thank a few folks here. Uh, Stetson Summer Grant allowed for the work this summer, which was great. Good to have the, the buddy system here in SAGE over the summer too, which is always fun. Um, the Institute for Water and Environmental Resilience, or IWER, allowed me to use their songs this summer to take some of that water quality data. I'm thankful for that. Um, Rutgers University EOS Fellowship funded me to start thinking about this stuff at all. And then Rangers at Canaveral National Seashore and a few folks at New Smyrna Beach Leisure Services helped me figure out field sites over the summer, which was tricky, but they were really accommodating nice. All right. I've already highlighted my steps in student researchers, Sage, Laura, Verenia, Tom, Haley, and Brianna. They're doing great work. I'm really thankful to have them help me out on, on this project and tangential ones. And then finally, a few folks at Rutgers and otherwise uh, that help with the startup of this project, Danny Barnes, Heidi Fuchs, Grace Saba. And then John Cohen was actually my PhD advisor at the University of Delaware who pushed and pushed until I finally realized the responses to light are both interesting and important. So I am grateful for that. And finally, thank you for listening. And I'd be happy to take any questions. <laughs> One question for you. Yeah. Uh, with the, the two locations, you had the uh, shallow and the deep, which is really at relative depth. So, so how were there differences in the actual depths of the water column in those two locations? Small ones. Yeah, I purposely positioned us so that they would be similar. Um, and so the, the one in New Smyrna Beach had a bigger range in terms of tide. Um, and so we were kind of in a position where we were measuring at depths between two and three meters there. And then at Canaveral National Seashore, it was always two meters regardless of size. So they're pretty close. But yeah, you're right, that would make a difference for sure. We have a question from Dr. Farrell. Yeah. In the field data, the quarter moon had really high biomass. Were you expecting highest abundance at the new and or full moon given other published studies? I, I was. Uh, <laughs> I was because 
moon cues a lot of hatching in terms of some of the benthic species that we have, right? It's a good time to hatch because you can flush your larvae offshore for a bit. And so, yeah, I was really surprised by that. I do not know what's going on, um, but I will know a little bit more about the individual groups within when we look into the abundance data. But yeah, I was not expecting that, nor do I know exactly what's happening. So we'll find out. I mean, based on the timing of these two, there were some tidal differences that were sort of unavoidable. So I'll look more into that and see if there's any signatures there that make sense. Um, but yeah, I was also surprised by that. And then um, there was one other person, give me one second to look them up of who it was. Uh, Dr. Work uh, says, fantastic job, thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Dr. Work. <laughs> First of all, it's another NBL of this field. Data. There seems like a lot of variables and parameters that you're obviously aware of. So I actually had a question about your lab mm -hmm. data and your lab setup. Yeah. Um, so it's like a five centimeter by five centimeter. The cube that the animals are in are in, in okay. five by five and inch. Yeah. Did you mimic like temperature, uh, solute concentration, and all of the other variables um, compared to like your field studies? And I also have a follow up question about light and Okay, so first, <laughs> what's the chamber like? Yeah. Um, so I kept all of the parameters the same except for light for those experiments. And so I used the environmental salinity and temperature that I knew that they would do really well in and they were reared that way in the lab. So basically I didn't want to have any other stress. <laughs> so I figured out, okay, well, how do they do best when they develop? And then we'll apply that. So they sat in the cuvette that way. But then I was able to control the light environment and stick them in the middle of um, essentially Snell's window for light. And so they weren't getting any sort of bright light cues on the outside of that either. So yes, all of the parameters in there not mimicking necessarily the fluctuations in the field by any means, just looking at the light effect, which will then be affected by those, hence the necessary field step afterwards. <laughs> yeah. And then you showed this data with like 11, 12, 13, mm -hmm. 14 on an x-axis with light intensity. I'm assuming that also mimics so that you're studying. So I guess I'm assuming I know the answer to this, but the reason you stop at the highest light intensity is because if you kept going, that would no longer mimic uh, the environment. Because it seems like you're seeing, at least to me, an effect that which makes sense at higher light intensities. Um, but are you able to go higher or are you just stop because it's basically pointless if you just went higher? Yeah, um, all of those things actually. So the light levels that range use is pretty common. Depends on on the clouds and other things, but pretty common around twilight, which we know is when a lot of these animals move. And so I've done more experiments than I'd like to talk about um, with crab larvae and what light intensity would work for them. And I've used other light sources to do that, but I had a good idea of what intensities to use prior to the experiments. They also do mimic things that are more natural, like you don't want to blast them with light. And I have found, although I, I'll admit, I wish I had gone one further in this experiment, but it is hard to tell when you're doing it. <laughs> you're going to get the data doesn't just pop out for you, unfortunately. Um, but I wish I had gone one brighter here for each of these. But when you when the light is too bright, you just get confused. Um, and we don't always see, and sometimes they get so confused that they just like stop and then swim up and down and sideways, it doesn't make any sense. Right? It's just not relevant that increase to go from dark to really bright doesn't make sense. Yeah, that was a good question. I was also curious about the same thing you took on that, the other kind of water quality measurements when you've been able to analyze those yet, or is there any one uh, characteristic you measured that you think might be yeah. more relevant? Yeah, so I haven't done in-depth analysis of this at all, but there, there are cues for tides, salinity and turbidity, right? And on those days, I'm going to be very aware of the effect of if I had a tide coming in, that abundance is going to be different and therefore the biomass is going to be different. And so I have to be really careful about the way that I talk about these data um, because of those cues too, but at least I have all of them and I have tidal data. And so, you know, I can point out the weaknesses where they're appropriate. Uh, but yeah, I have a suspicion that when I have incoming tides, that's going to be very different than some of my other data points. So, find out. 
Chris, is your hand raised from before? Yes, it is. Thank you for pointing that out. Uh, Dean Scomp says, thank you for the opportunity to hear about your research and your collaborations with students and colleagues. That's nice. Thanks, Dean Scomp. <laughs> Chris, you've done a good job mediating the chat. I'm yes. guessing that there's no other questions in there. <laughs> none, none, none so that I've seen. I'd say that's about it. Okay, great. Well All then, right. we'll call it a day. Thanks so much. <laughs>